My dear Frodo, hobbits really are amazing creatures. You can learn all that there is to know about their ways in a month, and yet after a hundred years, they can still surprise you. J.R.R. Tolkien's three-part fantasy from Middle Earth was first published in the 50s. While he initially intended it as just a sequel to The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings has become so wildly popular it was voted Britain's favorite book ever back in 2003. And there have been multiple adaptations in the half century since its first publication. Several radio dramatizations, an animated feature film, and of course, the one we're talking about here, Peter Jackson's award-winning epics from the early aughts. Great, so let's just deal with all three of them at the same time. Ha! Just ha, man. Fine, we'll just start with The Fellowship of the Ring. So, without further ado, and no restraint on spoilers, it's time to ask, what's the difference? To start with, let's clarify what version of the film we're talking about. Since it is likely the most viewed version, we're talking about the original theatrical cut of The Fellowship of the Ring. Any other differences in the 30 extra minutes of the extended edition, you can tell us about in the comments section. It's also important to remember that we're just dealing with The Fellowship of the Ring here, not the entire trilogy. So, if we leave something out that becomes meaningful in the second or third book, we'll get to it in our second or third episode. So with that little disclaimer, let's get started. The Fellowship of the Ring starts off with an extensive prologue detailing the long history of the hobbits as a people. Tolkien describes things like the geography of the Shire and surrounding areas, the importance of pipe weed, and a few thoughts on the Hobbit's skill as record keepers. This part of the Fellowship of the Ring reads largely as a historical text, shedding light on the origin of the Hobbits before they head out on their adventure. The film similarly begins with an extensive prologue. Its prologue, however, focuses on the forging of the Great Rings. This story is ultimately told by Gandalf in the second chapter of the book, but the fact the movie opens on the history of the One Ring is telling. Right away, the film focuses on the danger and evil lurking within Sauron's ring, as opposed to an anthropological study of the people at the center of the story. From there, the book moves straight into the long-awaited party, Bilbo's 111th birthday celebration. Gandalf arrives with some rad fireworks, and much is made of Bilbo and Frodo's meddling relatives, the Sackville Bagginses. At the party, Bilbo makes a scene by bidding farewell to his kin before slipping on the ring and disappearing completely. The movie's version of these events play out basically the same. After the party, however, we come to one of the main differences between book and movie. Gandalf begins to suspect the ring immediately, telling Frodo to keep it secret, keep it safe before taking off to go do some research. He then returns in basically the amount of time it takes to ride from Hobbiton to Minas Tirith and back to discover that, yup, this ring is real bad news. One ring to bring them all, and in the darkness, bite them. In the book, though, after the party, Gandalf is gone for three years. Then a few years go by where he visits the Shire frequently. Then he's gone for nine more years before finally coming back to give Frodo the full story of the ring. In the movie, a stricken and concerned Gandalf sends Frodo and Sam out of the Shire literally at dawn the next morning. Or at the very least, we're meant to read it that way based on how the movie is edited. Book Frodo takes a much more measured approach to leaving the Shire. Gandalf hangs out for a few weeks before they even talk about how to best leave. Then Frodo sells his home at Bag End to the Sackville Bagginses, buys another place in another town, and moves all of his stuff there so as not to arouse suspicion. Big picture here is Frodo is 33 at Bilbo's birthday party, and he leaves the Shire with the ring when he's 50. That means 17 full years go by before any action is taken to destroy the ring. The movie follows Frodo and Sam's departure with a quick montage of them walking across the countryside, with shots beginning at dawn, progressing through the day, and wrapping up towards dusk, implying just one more day has passed. And it's played as though it's within the next day that they run into Merry and Pippin, then evade the Black Riders, making it to Bree and the end of the Prancing Pony later that night. Whether or not there are more nights on the road hidden by the cuts between scenes is completely irrelevant. The pace of these edits makes us think that it's happening very quickly. Once they leave the Shire in the book, the hobbits do run into Merry and Pippin and must evade the Black Riders, but they also spend a night at Old Maggot's farm, drinking beer and having a nice meal. Then they stop at Brandy Hall for a handful of nights with comfortable baths and full bellies. Oh, and singing! Like, so much singing! Then they spend three whole chapters in the company of Tom Bombadil, a seemingly ancient protector of the forest who saves saves their lives a few different times in fairly rapid succession. Why don't you stay with me, little guys? <laughs> You would expect a book as densely authored as Tolkien's classic to have cuts for time, even when the film is as thoroughly adapted as Peter Jackson's. But these cuts aren't strictly edits to the narrative. These cuts instead seem to shift the focus of the narrative from the journey being long and arduous in the book to the immediate danger posed by the ring in the movie. Even cutting Tom Bombadil, which is on its surface an entirely narrative edit, serves this function. 
It's not leaving the safety of the Shire that imperils our heroes, it's the ring and the urgency with which it must be moved to Rivendell that drives the action. But once the book and movie arrive at the Prancing Pony, we begin to see some more significant character differences. Aragorn, or Strider as he's first known to Frodo, plays a bit more outgoing in the book. He has a handful of sarcastic, bordering on dickish comebacks for the hobbits when they first meet. He's also carrying the shattered Narsil, the sword used to cut the One Ring from Sauron's hand way back in the day. He even seems downright antsy to see the sword reforged. In the movie though, the shards of Narsil reside in Rivendell, and movie Aragorn is more than a little reluctant to take up the mantle that goes with his lineage. While book Aragorn does question his own ability to lead the hobbits safely on their quest, there is little trace of self-doubt in movie Aragorn's actions, at least where the route through Middle-earth is concerned. His place in the Kingdom of Men is another matter entirely. After teaming up with Strider, the hobbits evade the Black Riders and Bree once again. They take their time heading back into the wild, and when they do, it's in full view of half the town. The movie uses a wide shot of Bree in the pre-dawn hours, with the hobbits hustling up a hilltop to imply a sneaky and immediate exit. And again, when Frodo is stabbed on Weathertop, he's not immediately incapacitated like he is in the movie. Instead, Aragorn and the hobbits travel with the still-functioning Frodo for nine days. Then an elf named Glorfindel finds them and guides them through the wild towards Rivendell for two more days before the ring wraiths catch back up to them. In the movie, Frodo gets stabbed at night, Aragorn chases the ring wraiths off at night, tends to Frodo at night, before being joined by Arwen, Aragorn's lady elf sweetheart, who immediately takes off with Frodo en route to Rivendell that same night. If I seem like I'm overstressing the time of day in which these events are portrayed, it's because I am. The language of cinema dictates, more often than not, that all these events are taking place in the same night. When we rejoin Arwen, she's sprinting across a field at dawn, implying only a few more hours have passed since she began her flight. If you want him, come and claim him. Ultimately, Arwen makes it to the river with Frodo into her people's lands before summoning a flood to wash away the ring rates. But in the book, it's Glorfindel who sends his horse, bearing Frodo in a sprint towards the river. And when the still conscious Frodo reaches the other side, the flood springs up seemingly out of nowhere, and it's not until later we discover that Elrond of Rivendell has summoned it. So, while also mixing in some modernized gender politics, the movie sees Frodo get stabbed, followed by a literal sprint to save him. In the book, he's got a shard of the Ringwraith's blade stuck in his shoulder for 17 days. The movie, again, consistently opts to make the threats more present and the danger more immediate. Now, the movie version, being a fantasy adventure epic, does add a handful of scenes to make it more thrillingly cinematic. For example, Gandalf and Saruman's rad wizard fisticuffs don't appear in the book. After Frodo wakes up in Rivendell, Book Gandalf describes how he was detained on the roof of Saruman's tower, but not much else. Nor do we see any of the preparations Saruman is making for war. In fact, from this point on, the book and movie line up pretty well, with a few minor changes here and there. The Council of Elrond decides on the Fellowship. In the movie, they all volunteer, but in the book, Elrond appoints each member, including those rascally hobbits Merry and Pippin. You shall be the Fellowship of the Ring. Right. Where are we going? Before the Fellowship ever sets out, Narsil is reforged by the Elves of Rivendell, and Aragorn renames it Anduril, the Flame of the West. In the movies, Narsil isn't reformed until much later, but, like we said, we're just covering the Fellowship of the Ring in this episode. Either way, once they set out from Rivendell, Gandalf outlines a route that lasts 40 days, in a rare reference to a lengthy passage of time in the movie. But even then, they run into birds that are spies of Saruman, which quickly causes them to change their plans and attempt to cross Caradas. So there's still a sense that they've only been traveling for a few days before they are turned back by snow and falling rocks. In the movie, the snow is caused by Saruman, as opposed to just the naturally inclement weather on the mountain. This is another addition that places Saruman's villainy more front and center in the movie than it is in the book. After failing to cross the mountain, they make for the Mines of Moria, a trip on screen that takes no time at all. The journey from the top of Caradas to the entrance of Moria in the book is much more eventful. The Fellowship is attacked by wargs, and Gandalf even uses some pretty boss-sounding magical fire to fight them off. The decision to cut a nighttime ambush around a campfire may have been difficult, but even a cinematic fight scene involving pretty boss-sounding magical fire would have slowed the pace of the movie. Either way, in both book and movie, they're forced forward into the mine by a gnarly, squid, kraken-looking thing. Gandalf says it's a four-day trip through Moria, and that may or may not have been the case. The events depicted in the dark of Moria, where you can't tell day from night, seem to have taken two or three full days in both the book and movie. So the trip through Moria, culminating with the now iconic You Shall Not Pass scene on the bridge of Khazad Dun, are basically the same, and so is the now Gandalfless Fellowship's trip through Lothlorien afterwards. Lady Galadriel lets the Fellowship rest in Lothlorien, shares a terrifying vision in her mirror with Frodo, and then turns down his offer to give her the ring in a, well, not terribly subtle way. Oh, shall love me 
am the spell. Then, after leaving Lothlorien and the elves behind on the river, the Book Fellowship's journey takes a few days, even having to fend off a pack of orcs and a Nazgul flying on his huge dragon fellbeast thing before finally reaching the waterfall. The movie sees the Fellowship go ashore for the first time at the edge of the falls after an uneventful but scenic float. It's not until after Frodo's confrontation with Boromir, which in both book and movie proves that Boromir is lost to the ring's influence and Frodo decides to strike out on his own, that they are beset by orcs that ultimately kill Boromir and make off with Merry and Pippin. The book wraps up with Frodo putting on the ring, disappearing completely, and sneaking off into a boat to continue his journey alone. Unlike the movie, where he has a soul-searching conversation with Aragorn, none in the party know that Frodo is taking off. Sam figures that Frodo would be heading to the boats, then almost drowns trying to join him, just as he does in the movie. As of the final pages of The Fellowship of the Ring, Boromir is alive and Merry and Pippin have not been kidnapped. So does that happen at the beginning of The Two Towers? I mean, probably. To be honest, I'm reading these for the first time as they're doing these episodes, so hang on, let me skip ahead. Oh yeah, totally. Like, two pages in. Okay, okay, so the end of the Fellowship movie borrows from the first two pages of the Two Towers book. But again, the big difference with the Fellowship of the Ring versions is the pace. The book covers almost 20 years, while the movie seems to take place over the course of a couple of weeks. Whether it's literally supposed to be less than a month's worth of journeying or not, the effect is felt. The danger posed by the Ring in the film is nipping at the Fellowship's heels from the opening prologue to the parting of the ways. Okay, so while you were talking just now, I read a little further ahead and Dude, check this out. Nope, 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 nope. First two pages is all the two towers they're getting. Ah, oh, man. Make sure to subscribe to Cinefix so you don't miss the rest of the two towers installment of our journey through Middle Earth right here on What's the Difference? Nobody tosses a dwarf. Yeah! Ah, not the beer!